I used to work as a missing persons detective. This is the case that made me quit. I joined the force young, 21 years old. From the start, I was always taken by the idea of missing persons cases. It was more morally straightforward than homicide, more interesting than drugs. There was a pureness and righteousness in finding missing people which was hard to find in other areas of policing. It was unfaultable work. I would only ever be doing good. Of course, I spent my time walking the beat first, six years before I could finally take the promotional exam to make detective. And after that, it was another four years before the opportunity came to transfer into the missing persons department. I was truly passionate about the job, something which not many people can say. Every day I could feel as though I was truly making a difference. Delivering a presumed dead child back to their parents is an indescribably fulfilling experience. Of course, on the flip side came a crushing despair every time a case went cold. No matter how impossible the case seemed, no matter how much I reassured myself that there was nothing more I could do, there was always a voice in the back of my mind reminding me that the victim was still out there somewhere. The worst thing was when we found a corpse, knowing that I had failed to save a life. There are so many out there that I've never found or found too late. I see their faces over and over again in my dreams. The perpetrators have also stuck with me. I dealt with a lot of sick, sick people in my time. I had a lot of horrible cases, a lot of times I doubted myself. But like I said, this is the one which made me leave the profession for good and never look back. By now in my career, I was one of the most senior detectives in the department. I got the lead on most cases and was generally looked to as someone to take charge when things took a turn for the worse. I walked into the station and was notified first thing about the call that had come through during the night. Five children, two girls and three boys, between the ages of four and six, had disappeared from the same neighborhood, literally within a few blocks of one another in the same day. I'm not going to tell you their names or who they were, out of respect for them and their families. I'm also not going to give any place names or details which might give too much information about the case away. Trust me, you're better off knowing less. With the extremely similar circumstances between each disappearance, I made the executive decision to treat this as a serial kidnapping case. Normally in these situations, some creep is driven around the neighborhood in a van, taking as many kids as he can. So right away, we got to work. I know it's a cliche, but the first 48 hours really are the most important on these kinds of things. Wanting to move quickly, my partner and I went to interview one of the set of parents and sent junior detectives to interview the others. The parents I interviewed told me that they had last seen their son the previous morning, when he had gone out to play on the front lawn. The mother had been out there supervising him, but she had had to step back inside for 30 seconds to turn off the oven. When she hurried back outside, her son was gone. Brief questions posed to neighbors gave no further clues. None of them had seen anything. The other detectives had come back with similar stories. Parents turning their back for a moment, and their child disappearing in the meantime. With no leads, we began our second step checking CCTV in the surrounding area. Luckily, the suburbs where the kids were taken were surrounded by dense commercial areas, high streets, and shopping centers. These kinds of places always have loads of security cameras, but it takes time accessing and checking that much footage and we were already losing valuable hours. I was able to get permission from my supervisors to rope in more officers to check all the cameras as quickly as possible. Credit to my team, it only took us 24 hours to find the right piece of footage. Myself and a few of my higher ranking colleagues, as well as the two detectives who had found the evidence, had gathered in my office to analyze it. I remember that those two, only junior detectives at the time, looked a bit shaken when they brought the footage to us. When we all sat down to watch, they warned us that the contents of the clip was strange. <sighs> Looking back, that was the wrong word for it. We asked them to sum up what was in the video first. They told us we needed to see for ourselves. The camera which had caught the video was at the back of the supermarket, facing one of those street depots where food trucks pull in to unload and restock. You know, those creepy looking alleys behind stores, full of cardboard boxes. They always give off an eerie vibe when you pass them in the street. 
This particular site had openings on two public roads, which is how the perp must have got access. The roads were unusually quiet ones for the area, which explains how nobody noticed. The CCTV footage began with the long alley empty. Then, far, far back, right at the end, we began to see a blurry, pixelated shape appear out of the dark. We couldn't make out what it was yet. It was still in the low-quality image stage. The shifting mass of fuzzy pixels grew closer and closer and closer until we could make out an adult on foot with several children behind him. We were taken aback. Unusual for kidnappers to stay on foot. This made it much harder to see how he could have taken the kids without garnering attention. Eventually, the group came within clear view and we all let out audible gasps. A mixture of shock, confusion, and, at least in my case, fright. You see a lot of things in the job that give you the shivers, but not much like what was on that video screen. I'll do my best to describe the surreal sight that met our eyes. The man, and we could tell by his imposing height that it was a man, was wearing a disturbing getup. He had one of those Mr. Punch masks, you know, the, the classic puppet character, an unsettling thing with a too long nose, hooked chin, and bulging eyes. The skin on the face mask had been painted far too pale, almost snow white, brazenly contrasting with the crimson tinted cheeks, giving the unintentional complexion of someone at death's door. The mask was cartoonish, with heavily exaggerated angles and features, and I'm not afraid to say that it made me extremely uncomfortable. There was something about the popping eyes, with their swollen veins and poorly sketched pupils, that seemed to stare at me through the screen, and past that, into my mind. And the smile, it was only a mask, but the smile gave off an unmistakable air of malice and insidious intent. When I looked at the mask too long, I felt deeply afraid. I felt as if something dark and terrible was searching hungrily for me. Whoever the creator of this visage was, they were an unhinged individual. The man wore a bizarre hat, black, shaped almost like a medieval jester's, complete with silver baubles at the end of each sleeve. The cap and bells went down the back of his head far enough that his hair was obscured. He had a strange kind of coat on, more like a robe. It had no buttons or zipper, and it was long, too long, flowing past his ankles and pooling on the ground around him in folds, almost like a miniature bridal train. The coat was formed of hundreds of colored patches, stitched together, but you couldn't describe it as colorful. None of the patches were bright or vibrant. Each was a different dark hue, some muddy brown, some gray, some a deep maroon, some dirty yellow, some chemical orange, some inky green. Not one color was actually aesthetically pleasing, almost as if the coat had been sewed with intention of causing visual discomfort. The coat had many, many pockets far more than could ever be filled. It seemed that almost every patch had a pocket stitched into it. From two of these pockets, the two on his left and right hip, stretched a handkerchief of ribbon. The handkerchiefs were composed of a pattern of black and white alternating diamonds. The handkerchief stretched a few meters behind the man, and gripping tightly onto the fabric were the children. A scan of their faces confirmed that these were the missing kids we were looking for. And yet... None of them looked traumatized. None were upset or crying. They all smiled and laughed, gripping the handkerchiefs. The strips of fabric were like those magician tricks, uh, the never-ending ones. The children held on with both hands, three on one side, two on the other. They skipped along happily and energetically. Clearly, they had been groomed by this weirdo in the mask. Disturbingly, he himself also skipped. He raised his knees in jovial leaps, almost like a dance or a jive, and each time he frolicked up and down, he lifted his feet, which were encased in strange, pointed shoes that curled upwards. Keeping time to this eerie jig down the dark alley, the man held a wooden pipe to the mouth hole in the grinning mouth of the mask. He was playing the same tune over and over again. It was green sleeves. If you don't know the melody, I suggest you look it up. That tune has always been a personal favorite of mine. Something about the simple melody repeated over and over again is utterly entrancing. But hearing it in this setting, 
It was nothing but terrifying. The tune was too absorbing. It was almost hypnotic. When I listened for too long, I couldn't tear my eyes away from the screen. There was also something slightly off about the man's playing. Hard to pin down. A small, discordant note every now and then. The procession continued through the alley, the haunting figure at the front leading the troop until they passed out of the security camera's viewing range. My fellow investigators and I were gobsmacked. We had absolutely no idea what to think. Never in any of our respective careers had we seen anything like this. Could this really be happening? Was that eerie figure really out there somewhere? At least it did a little so strengthen our resolve. There was no way that we were going to leave those kids with somebody that insane. We quickly sent out reports calling for anyone seeing someone matching the odd description of the man we had seen to come forward as soon as they could. At a point like that, witness sightings were our best bet. I made the mistake of reassuring the anguished parents that we were going to bring their children home. But as the days went by, we had to widen our search from city to district, and then after a week, the state. We wanted to be absolutely sure we caught him. We had our first press conference. We released a still photo of the security footage along with it, leading to a lot of ridiculous questions. I think it was right at the end of the first week when the first newspaper gave the kidnapper his name. The Piper. I'll admit, it was fitting. The strange outfit, musical accessory, and most of all, the way those kids were just happily skipping along next to him, as if in a trance. It all harked back to that age-old Pied Piper story. The name stuck. Soon, all of the press were calling him that. And then the public. The public loved criminals with a nickname. I'll admit, even us in the station began calling him the Piper. Unfortunately, no sightings came through. Nobody had seen the distinctive figure. We were just beginning to lose hope when we got the call. A man a few towns over had spotted a man dressed in attire matching the Pipers with the children behind him in the alley behind his apartment building late at night. We went over there and interviewed the man, but he couldn't tell us more than what he had seen. It was very late, he was very tired, and he was sure his eyes had been playing tricks on him. Luckily, the building had a security camera facing the alley, we were given access to the reels of the footage over the last few days, and trawled back until we found the period of time during which the man had reported spotting the piper. This footage was watched only by me and my partner, Jeffords, in the security room of the apartment building. With a similar angle to the first video, the camera faced down the long, dark alley. The cobbles were littered with broken glass and junk. This was a much shadier district. And then we began to hear that same haunting melody. Green sleeves. It sounded as if it was coming from somewhere far off in the darkness at first, but it gradually got closer, and the closer it got, the more I began to shiver. Once again, we saw the same sight emerge as we had in the first piece of footage. The scene was practically unchanged. The Piper still wore that same disturbing mask, the same peculiar hat and coat, and he again proceeded slowly, rhythmically forward, dancing through the night. Still, he held that wooden pipe to his lips and played. And still, the five poor children were behind him, either side. Still, they clutched tightly with both hands to the long black and white handkerchiefs. But whereas before they had laughed and skipped along with their tormentor, now their faces were gaunt and tear-stained. They looked thin, horribly thin, far thinner than they had before. I had the awful thought that these children looked as if they hadn't eaten in a week, and they had been moving across the country on foot for most of that time. They didn't frolic now. They stumbled and tripped, as if they were being pulled along by the piper and his handkerchiefs. Yet still, they gripped the fabric. Still, they refused to let go. They were clearly in tremendous pain and tremendously fatigued. Why didn't they let go? As Jeffers and I watched in horrified silence, the piper removed one hand from his pipe, though he continued to play, deftly manipulating his instrument with only five fingers. His other hand reached into one of the many pockets of his coat. As he drew the hand out, we could make out something pink and gray squirming in his hand. 
I squinted at the computer screen we were watching the footage on and made the dreadful realization that he was holding a rat. The rat looked well-fed. It was large and muscular. However, the mangly fur hinted at some kind of disease. The piper lifted the rodent by the tail as it clawed and twisted in the air, gnashing its jagged teeth. It looked mad with aggression, almost rabid. He suddenly tossed it backwards behind himself and the kids. It hit the ground on all fours and scampered into the shadows. He then reached into a different pocket, retrieving a second rat and performing the same chilling ritual as he had with the first. As I looked closer, I could just about make out the way the cloth of his coat was wriggling. How many did he have in there? My brain suddenly noticed something. There were more rats, a little way behind the procession, staying just within the shadows, but always following. They leapt and crawled over the trash and obstacles in their way, moving in small groups of threes and fours, tenaciously following behind. Eventually, the eerie figure of the piper and the poor children moved out of shot. But for at least ten minutes, the exodus of rats continued. Every so often, the small forms would dart along the alley, always following. The entire investigation team was utterly aghast. Whatever we were dealing with here, it was something far, far worse than we had first anticipated. We didn't tell the press or the public about the development in the case. This was kept strictly confidential. I felt confusion, and I felt helplessness, and I felt fear. Fear for the kids, trapped with that thing, and a deeper fear. Fear because I, I was beginning to realize that there are beings out there far beyond what human minds are able or willing to understand. Now, the trail began to go cold. We had no more witness sightings, and with a search area now so large, there was little we could do. I couldn't order car checks. The piper moved on foot. I tried offering a monetary reward. I tried helicopter searches. Nothing. I tried sniffer dogs. Still nothing. I felt utterly unable to do anything to help the missing children, and I felt solely responsible for whatever horror was being inflicted on them. The worst moment was facing the parents, telling them I had been wrong, that their little ones weren't going to come home. Soon it had been a month, and then two. The case was essentially dead. My colleagues stopped working on it, my superiors gave us new assignments. But I couldn't concentrate on any new cases. My mind was replaying the footage over and over again. My dreams were taken up with nightmarish visions of that horrible, spine-chilling mask. Then, three months later, I was on a visit to a different precinct, picking up some samples from their forensics lab. I overheard one of their officers talking about how, way upstate, the cops were getting flooded by reports of a massive freak rat migration, how in one town people were stuck in their homes as the streets were flooded with rodents. My mind instantly began to whir. Of course it was an absolute shot in the dark, but the piper had been seen heading upstate. It was completely the wrong time of year for that kind of behavior from the animals. Those kinds of migrations actually happen more than you'd think in some farm communities, but only in the late summer. One explanation I could think of was that they were being attracted to something, just like the rats in that alley. At that point in time, I was willing to do just about anything to find those kids, to bring some kind of closure. I asked the officers what town they meant. I'm not going to tell you its name, but it was a small rural community out in the backwoods surrounded by farmland. I did my own research and found that the town was a day's drive away. I didn't tell my superiors about this development. There was no way they were going to authorize me to investigate such a tenuous lead. The only person I confided in was Jeffords. He was just as invested as me. He agreed to come up with me. By the time we got round to going, the migrations had been over for a month. But that didn't matter. I was sure we would find something. From research and speaking to the locals, we discovered that the majority of the rats had been seen moving in the direction of an abandoned farm a half mile away. We arrived at the farm and were instantly hit by the eerie atmosphere. The sight of the big, decrepit windmill looming ahead made me shiver. And we noticed the rats immediately, too. By the time we arrived, the sunning was beginning to set, and as soon as we got out of the car, the rodents swarmed around our feet. 
They appeared from hay bales and shrubbery and skittered away just as fast under our boot heels. We made our way to the old farmhouse first and went from room to room, checking for anything. Here, the rats were even more populous, filling up corridors and diving out of rotting pantry shelves. We found nothing in the house, though we tore it apart, searching under beds and in cupboards. Next, we trudged up to the big barn on top of the hill. Looking up as we approached, I felt an unshakable sense of dread. The barn had been a true agricultural leviathan when it had been functioning. It must have been able to store more grain than could ever be needed. The red and white paint was peeling off now, and there was a large hole in the roof where the timbers had collapsed. Jeffords and I heaved open the large doors and entered. The smell hit us first. It was absolutely rancid. A mixture of feces and death. The interior was pitch black. We could literally see nothing inside. Turning on our flashlights, we cautiously made our way past the stacks of molding hay which were piled on top of each other, all the way up to the roof. The ground was obscured by layers of thick, muddy straw, which in turn was caked with rodent feces. The only light was that provided by our flashlights and the weak moonlight shining through the hole in the roof. The rats were all around us, constantly brushing up against our legs, scuttling past. When I pointed my flashlights at the stacks of hay, I could see it writhing and shifting, as if it was alive. Each bale must have been absolutely packed with the things. Every so often, one would leap out from the hay. The rats made me uneasy. They never quite plucked up the courage to attack us, but they screeched and bared their teeth whenever we passed them. When I pointed my flashlight into the distance of the path ahead of us, I could see thousands of yellow eyes staring from the shadows, watching us, chittering. It was one of the most eerie sights I've ever had the displeasure of seeing. I noticed it first, a faint sound coming from the end of the barn. As we got closer, hearts pounding, my ears could make it out to be that same tune, Green Sleeves. Except this time, it was slightly different. It wasn't being played on a wooden pipe. It had a different kind of tinkle, almost like a piano, but not quite. Now Jeffords and I were both extremely on edge, expecting any moment to see that horrific, smiling face peeking out from the shadows. Eventually, we drew close to the end of the barn. But the back wall came up too quickly. From the outside, the barn should have gone on for a few more minutes. And then we saw the door. In the center of the back wall was a rusty metal door. It was thick steel. It looked like it had been taken from an industrial site. There were deep scratches and dents in the surface, and rust stained it all over. As I drew closer to that door, I began to feel an unexplainable fear. I wanted to turn and run away from that wretched place and never come back. I did not want to see what lay beyond the door. I knew, somehow, that whatever its contents were, it would be awful. We found the source of the noise, sitting just in front of the door, an old, battered music box. I couldn't find any kind of switch or lever to turn it off, so we let it continue to play its hypnotic tune. It acted almost as a background theme as we continued. The door, strangely, was not locked. We pulled the handle down and, with some effort, it creaked open. Instantly, the smell hit us. It was a hundred times worse than when we had first entered the barn. Jeffords turned and vomited on the floor. I knew, in the pit of my stomach, what we were going to find in there. I'm going to describe what was behind the door as best as I can, in such a way that is still respectful to the deceased. I don't want to go into graphic detail, especially not in this kind of case, but I have to. I must. I need to get across the horror. If I come across as apathetic in my retelling of it, that's because I've wept for so long that I am numb now. There was a room behind the door. Somebody had put up a fake back wall in order to conceal its presence. The room was small, but not cramped. There was a table set up in the center with five chairs around it. The walls, floor, and furniture of the room were smeared with rat feces like the rest of the barn, but in an even higher concentration. There were thick chains connected to the walls which ran all the way to each chair. Each chair had two chains, each with a monocle on the end, presumably to shackle the feet. 
In the center of the table, there was a pot of crayons and colored pencils, and there were stacks upon stacks of paper drawings, children's drawings, of houses and stick figures and pirate ships and random scribbles. God knows how long that monster kept those poor kids in there. Every drawing was soaked with blood. There was also blood splattered on the table, chairs, walls, and floor. It was long dried and crusted. This is more difficult than you can imagine for me to write. We didn't find a single whole body in there. Only bits and pieces. A few gnawed limbs, appendages, and torsos. Scattered all over the room. Every body part we found was covered in bite marks, almost stripped to the bone in some places. Tiny little gouges made by tiny little teeth. The piper had kept those children in there. He had attracted the waves of rats. He had chained them up so they didn't have a chance. He had left the rats to devour them. It has taken me a few tries to type this. I, I can't stop myself from gagging. We found that mask, lying in the middle of the floor amidst the blood and the feces. It stared up at us, grinning, mocking, laughing. You couldn't save them, it giggled. We left the barn in a daze. I stomped on the music box, crushing it between my boot. We called for backup, and it soon arrived. Already, Jeffords and I had decided to just tell the parents we had found the bodies. Nothing more, no details. Over the next few weeks, our team found more in the room. A few teeth, bones, strands of hair, fingers. DNA tests confirmed them to belong to the five missing children. All five accounted for. On the chairs, they found traces of human urine and feces confirming our fears. The children had suffered for a long time. In one corner, they found the handkerchiefs. We tested them. They were covered in super glue. Scraps of skin and torn flesh where small hands had been ripped away. <laughs> the Piper wasn't an eldritch being. He didn't lure the kids to follow him through mystical means. He was just a sick, twisted, depraved monster of a man. <sighs> Wasn't he? You see... Ever since that day in the barn, I haven't been able to get that Greensleeves tune out of my head. Even after a year, I find myself humming it. No matter how much it revolts me. Even when I'm able to force myself to stop, it continues to play at the back of my mind. But nowadays, when it's late at night and I'm alone, either in my room or working a night shift in my new accounting job, I hear it clearly now, as if something is playing it on a wooden pipe just outside, and I want to listen, I want to go outside, I want to... <sighs> Sorry, I've just had to stop my foot from tapping to the rhythm. I want to follow the music off into the dark. Thank you for watching this video. Big shout out to my patrons, Leaf Ninja, Roy Larimer, Mr. Creepypasta, Nicole Kister, Neon Scoundrel, William Delphin, and So Much Heresy. If you want to become a patron, buy merch, or join my Discord server, be sure to check out the links in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video.